Throughout the lectures on basic principles of objectivism, you have heard Mr. Brandon refer to the error of treating emotions as tools of cognition and to the disastrous philosophical and psychological consequences of this error. Tonight I want to discuss the specifically psychoepistemological aspects of this phenomenon, to discuss what we call the emotional perceptual level of consciousness, as opposed to the conceptual level of consciousness. We'll analyze its nature and meaning, its causes, the mechanism by which it occurs, its consequences, and what can be done to correct it. Nobody starts out in life with the idea that his mind is not his means of knowing reality, and that instead he ought to rely on emotions to give him knowledge about the world, about right and wrong, about what goals to choose, what actions to take. The philosophical theory that emotions are tools of cognition is, for most people who grant it any degree of credence, a rationalization after the fact. That is, they form certain psychoepistemological habits, the habit of focusing on their emotions, the habit of giving emotions priority in any mental process or active judgment. Then they reach for a philosophical justification and sanction for their psychoepistemology. Men are psychoepistemological mystics before they are philosophical mystics. What does it mean to be a psychoepistemological mystic? to function on the emotional perceptual level of consciousness. It means that in any situation, one's central concern is with what one feels rather than with facts and knowledge, that that's where one's mental focus habitually goes. It means to hold ideas for which one can give no rational justification which one holds only because they have an emotional appeal or power. It means to experience emotional reactions with no knowledge of and no concern for their source or validity, to love and hate, accept and reject, desire and fear, with no effort or ability to say why, on what grounds. It means that in any conflict between reason and emotions, it is emotions that are the stronger motivating force and will be one's guide to action. It means to use reason as a tool of rationalization, as a means of attempting to justify conclusions or decisions which have already been accepted on the basis of one's feelings. The questions we must consider then are these. What has a man done to himself psychoepistemologically in order to reach such a state? What is the nature of the mental processes that made it possible and caused it to become a habitual state of consciousness? What are the specific means by which emotions come to determine and or distort one's thinking? And how can such habits be formed to a considerable degree, even in those who might violently reject, in conscious terms, the idea that emotions may properly be employed as tools of cognition? Let me begin by giving you two simple illustrations of the category of mental processes that can result in the subsequent treating of emotions as sources of knowledge. You're walking down the street one day, and you're accosted by a Puerto Rican beggar. He's apparently very drunk. He asks you for money, and you refuse. He becomes nasty and belligerent, perhaps even threatening. You walk away from him, slightly shaken by the incident, but you don't think about it further. You don't identify the meaning of what occurred. The whole incident is simply filed away in your mind without further thought. That is, you file away together the fact that the man was Puerto Rican, 
that he was drunk, that he was unpleasant, that your encounter was disturbing and upsetting. A week later, you happen to be riding on the subway, and you see two Puerto Rican men engaged in a violent argument. The argument turns into a fist fight, and then knives are drawn. The passengers in the car, yourself included, are frightened by the obvious potential danger to themselves. But finally, a policeman comes along, and the two men are removed. Again, you don't think about the event. You simply file in your mind, unanalyzed, fight, danger, unpleasantness, Puerto Ricans. Several weeks later, you're out for a walk, and you pass another Puerto Rican. This time, it's a well-dressed, dignified man. He stops you to ask, perfectly politely, if you can direct him to a certain street. You feel an immediate aversion and fear, as though on the premise, a premise you had never consciously formulated and would not endorse consciously, that all Puerto Ricans are dangerous and untrustworthy. Why did this happen? Why did you react emotionally in this manner? It happened precisely because you had failed to identify the elements creating your former emotionally unpleasant experiences, because you had failed to separate out consciously and to discriminate the nationality of the threatening beggar and of the two men on the subway from their characters, their premises, their psychology. You had not identified that character traits, not nationality, was what united the men and incidents involved in the past experiences. You had filed in your subconscious, unanalyzed, unidentified, simply as unpleasant memories, the frightening nature of the two experiences, and the fact that the men who caused those experiences were of a certain nationality. You had filed not concepts and reasoned estimates, but concrete memories of events, plus the emotional estimates of those events as unpleasant or painful. Now, faced with a concrete that is similar to the former concretes in certain respects, your subconscious feeds you by association a lightning-like recollection of the former concretes, plus the negative emotion associated with them and temporarily tied to them. You react emotionally not fully to the present situation, to the man who now stops you to ask directions, but to a memory called out of your subconscious by the sight of an accidental resemblance or association between your present perception of the man's nationality and the logically irrelevant but emotionally related past. Again, assume that as a child, you had a teacher who had flaming red hair and who was very unjust in her treatment of you. During the same period, you had a close friend who also happened to have red hair. You were very fond of your friend, but then unexpectedly she disappointed you in some important way, causing you a great deal of pain. At the time, you didn't conceptually identify the fact that you suffered from both these individuals because they were irrational. You simply filed in your subconscious, unanalyzed, uninterpreted, the concrete events, the total of the two incidents, plus the emotional estimate, painful or bad. Then, years later, you find yourself unaccountably feeling antagonistic toward anyone with red hair, you find yourself, for no reason you can understand, emotionally expecting all manner of depravity from such a person, although you had certainly never consciously or explicitly decided that all red-haired people are vicious, and in fact you would consider such an idea ridiculous. 
But you react in this manner nevertheless because you had failed to judge the events conceptually, to look for the principle behind the actions that had caused you pain. 